Welcome to the Wilsonville Public Library Genealogy Club. Today we're going to talk about death certificates and the international classification of diseases. My name is Malia Lawton. I've been a librarian at the Wilsonville Public Library since 2004, and I've been doing genealogy since 1989 when I first started helping my mother research our family tree. Let's get started. What is a death certificate? It's an official document that gives information about a person's death such as when and how they died. Why do we need them? Well, they're used mainly for legal purposes. They allow the next of kin to settle the estates of the deceased, as well as collect on any pension benefits or life insurance. In some cases, widows needed them in order to remarry. In the case of my second great-grandmother, she needed to prove that her first husband had passed away in order to collect on the pension benefit of her second husband. Why did genealogists need them? Well, as you know, we always start with the most recent event in an ancestor's life. So we start with their death and work towards their birth. And every document that we look at provides clues to the past. Death certificates provide a large clue to our past. We also use them in order to collect medical history of our family especially to see if there's been any type of disease that's been passed down through the generations, such as cancer or maybe diabetes. What do you typically find on a death certificate? Well, you're gonna find the date of death, their full name, the cause of death, and it's gonna be signed by a doctor or a coroner or maybe a medical examiner. If you're really lucky, you might also get information on their marital or employment status, if they were a veteran of one of the wars, the address at the time of their death, which could be a hospital or it could be their home. You might also get the parents' names and their birthplaces. And then it's usually also signed by an informant. Hopefully that might be a family member. But keep in mind that not all death certificates are the same. Here's a couple of examples I have for you. In the middle, I have one that's on a three by five card, and this was taken out of a newspaper. So all I have on here is the name of the deceased, some parents' names, and a death year. Nothing more than that. On the right, I have one from New Hampshire, where this one I found out is actually been tra transcribed out of a town record book. And the reason I know that is there's two death dates or two years listed on here, not necessarily death dates. The one death date I have is 1819. And then down at the bottom, I have a 1905. So that at least lets me know that a 1905 is when they transcribed it out of the town record books and put them on these little sheets of paper. On the left, I have one that's from Philadelphia. It's uh, called a return of death. This one is a little bit closer to our typical death certificates where it's providing more information, such as the name, the age, and um, we've got employment and cause of death. There is a spot for parents' names. However, there's no names listed. And then we have their residence address, which is wonderful to use. Some other types of records that you might find are going to be ones that will be like a church book that will list all of the members of the church who had passed away. Uh, or you might also find uh, town records where it's all the people that died during a specific year in that specific town. But please keep in mind that the information on a death certificate is only as good as the informant. For the cause of death, an informant could be the coroner or maybe the medical professional. When it comes to the personal information of the deceased, it's probably going to be by a family member, maybe a friend or a neighbor. Sometimes it's the funeral director. And to err is human. So there might be errors in your death certificates. So it's always good to keep it in mind to watch out. Uh, they could be transcription errors could be the faulty memory of the informant. Um, poor handwriting. I've seen quite a bit of those where the 
electronic transcription was totally different than what was actually written on the actual document. Uh, it could also be a distraught or a stressed out informant. They might have just been completely out of it and weren't able to answer the questions as clearly as they wanted to. What's the original purpose of the death certificate? Well, we used them for statistics. They allowed us to count how many people died during a year, and they also let us see if there were specific diseases that were causing um, these deaths. So if there was a lot of heart disease or if it was some other type of plague or something. In the case of um, the deadly cholera epidemic in London, they were able to use death certificates in order to figure out how a disease was spreading. Uh, so this was 1854, and at the time, they thought cholera was uh, an airborne disease. And so many people were dying of it, they just they didn't know what to do. However, there was one doctor who felt that there had to be another reason. It couldn't just be airborne. So he started plotting out all the deaths of cholera in the Soho district of London. And he started to notice a trend. All of these deaths seemed to be centered around a very specific water pump. And when he examined it further, further, he found out that that water pump was infected with sewage. Once they cleaned out the water pump and got clean water going through it again, it seemed like the cholera epidemic started to decline and the deaths declined. So he realized that cholera was more of a waterborne disease than an airborne disease. Well, with everyone around the world dying of different diseases, or the same disease, but they all have different names, it's hard to be able to take your statistics from one country and compare them to another if you're not using the same terms. So an example is we have a bunch of different fevers here, and but they all have something in common. So we have malignant fever, jail fever, Irish fever, camp fever, hospital fever, spotted fever, and brain fever. What they all have in common? They are all ways to describe typhus. So as you can imagine, if we were in different countries and some were calling it malignant fever and others were calling it hospital fever, you wouldn't realize that you were talking about the same disease so there had to be a way to make this work so that everyone could use whatever term they wanted but be able to talk the same language to each other. So their solution was to create an international classification system using numbers, which turned into the International Classification of Diseases. And this was developed in the late 1800s. And its goal was to provide a unified way to communicate and track causes of death. It is currently maintained by the World Health Organization, and it's used by a variety of different nations. And in fact, the U.S. started using it in 1898. So how does this help us as genealogists? Well, let me show you. So here we have a death certificate that's from the state of Washington, and it's uh, 1935. And on here, we've got a lot of our great information. We've got the name of the deceased, where he died, a cause of death, we have informants, good information. But what I really want you to watch out for on your documents is look for anything that is out of place and odd, because that might be the key that you need to break down your brick wall. So on here, I have some numbers that are written in a handwriting that's different than any of the other handwriting on this document. Not sure what they mean, so we're going to try to research to figure out what else they could be. So we'll go with that first number at the top, which is that 369019. This is usually written in any clear space. There's always different numbers. I'm not sure what it could be. My first guess was that it could be a certificate number. However, 
every document that I saw had something different, but sometimes same. I wasn't sure. And then I thought, well, maybe it's de department coding. And again, because it kept changing around and there didn't seem to be any consistency, still wasn't quite sure what that is. So I still need to research to figure out what those numbers could mean. But to move on to the other number, I was able to discover what that is. So the number written by the cause of death is um, 82A. And this one is a little more consistent. I thought first that it could be like a running count of deaths. However, when I looked at all the death certificates within this database, I noticed the number repeated in some cases, especially when the cause of death was similar. But it was never, there were never consistent numbers in a row. So it didn't, running count of deaths didn't make sense. But because it did repeat, and the um, cause of death seemed to be similar, I wondered if it was a classification number. So I went to a website called Wolfbane Cybernetic, and what they have done is they've collected all of the International Classification of Diseases, or otherwise known as the ICD. And they have uploaded them online for us to have access to for free. The ICD is revised about every 10 years, and what they do is they assign numbers to a cause of death. So in that case of that typhus fever, that we noticed there could have been, if they called it malignant fever or Irish fever or ship fever, on the cause of death, they all would have had the number two next to them. So anyone in whatever country they were was reading that, they would all know that they were all talking about typhus and it didn't matter what they called the actual disease. So let's play around. We're gonna test out how the ICD works. So we're gonna take a look at that 82A and our cause of death looks like it says cerebral hemorrhage. So let's see what happens. So when you first start working with the ICD, the mo most important thing to remember is that you don't want to use a revision that is past the date of your death. So in this case, we have 1935. So when we look over at our ICD, we're gonna check out which ones we want. There is a revision number five that happened in 1938. So since that's after our death date, we don't want to use that number or that book. So we're going to go back one and use revision number four, which was in 1929. And when we pull up that book and we browse through the numbers and we come to 82A, we find cerebral hemorrhage as being the cause of death, which matches what we see written on the document. Another great thing about this ICD is it also helps you write, or not write, but read the doctor scribbles. So in this case, again, we have a 1935 document and it looks like they crossed out what was written there. And you can't tell what those first four letters are. And Mat Matui could be the last ones, I'm not sure. But the number that I have to work with is 159. So again, I go back into the ICD books, go to that revision number four. And when I find 159, I get premature birth. And as I read more of this death certificate, it fit that it was a young child who died. The other thing is, is the ICD can help you confirm that you've read the cause of death correctly. So in this case here, this is a 1932 death certificate, we have the number 51 to work with. And a cause of death looks like it says carcinoma of the penis. When I look up the number 51, I come out with cancer of the male genitalia. So again, it confirmed what I read. But like I said, you wanna watch out for that revision year. So again, with our original um, death certificate with the cerebral hemorrhage as being number 82, if I had looked at any other year, I would have gotten totally different results. So in 1900, we had 82 representing teething. 1909, 
cerebral embolism. 1920 was hysteria. 1938, motor, motor eh, neuron disease. So, as you can see, it would be a little funny to have cerebral hemorrhage written down as your cause of death and you transcribed it as teething. So, definitely make sure to watch out that revision year. The other great thing about these ICD lists is that they can help us identify causes of death even when there isn't an ICD number written next to the cause of death. And what you do is you can browse the list. So, in the case of this death, they died in 1893. Well, as you can see, in 1893, there is no index that I can use. So even though I tell you don't go to the index beyond it, we are in this case. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use a neat little um, feature on your computer that will help us search to figure out what this cause of death could be. And that is the find a word on a page feature. So it's either control F if you have a PC or you would use command F on your Mac. And what this allows us to do is we can pull up the web page and search certain letters or complete words and see if they occur on that page. So in this case, what I did was I could read the CON as my cause of death and I decided I'm going to search all the CONs in the index to find out what that whole word could be. And I eventually came to convulsions and as I looked at my list, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Another thing you could do is you could always try searching out old medical term books or websites and see if any of those words pop up on there. A great site to find a lot of these websites is Cindy's List. She has a whole collection of diseases and medical terms that you can browse through, but you can also Google them and see what comes up. Speaking of Google, I've also used Google in order to try to figure out what word I'm reading when I couldn't really figure it out just by looking at it. So again, example here, is when I first looked at this cause of death, I thought that the fourth letter was an R, or it could have been a V, but I wasn't quite sure. So in Google, I typed in conrusivis, which didn't make any sense when I typed it out, but we'll see. And Google was very nicely provided me with a possible misspelling or correct spelling of the word. And so they gave me convulsions. And so when I looked back and saw that that R that I thought was there was actually a V, everything started to fall into place. And in case you were wondering, nowadays with COVID and dominating our news and everything, I want to tell you that um, the ICD had been updated with a code for um, COVID-19. So in revision number 10, we have a selection of emergency codes that they can use for things to be updated instantly rather than waiting until the next revision. So in this case, anything that starts with a U ends up being an emergency letter or emergency code. And so for now, on death certificates, they are using U07.1 um, in order to represent that the person had died of COVID. Uh, in January 2022, we will have uh, revision number 11 come out, and that COVID number will be switched over to RA01 and have a more permanent position in the ICD index. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at lawton at wilsonvillelibrary.org. And your questions could be on this topic, or it could also be on anything related to genealogy. I'm always happy to help. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and good luck searching the ICD and discovering what cause of death was on the death certificates that you couldn't read. Have a good day.